This is the Iger Distinguished Speaker Series. Uh, Iger is an NSF-funded program uh, that uh, is uh, not only funding the speaker series, but also is designed to recruit PhD students into the specific area of our Iger. There are lots of Igers around the country, uh, but ours is specifically about smart environments and health systems in a smart environment. And so as part of that speaker series today, we have Dr. Alex Mihalidis, who comes from University of Toronto. He is a associate professor there and has joint appointments in three departments, occupational science and occupational therapy, uh, Institute of Biomaterials and Biomedical Engineering, and the Department of Computer Science. Uh, and he completed his PhD in Strathclyde, Glasgow. So, Hails from that side of the pond, I guess. Um, so uh, over the last many years, he's been doing research in pervasive computing and intelligent systems, again, with an emphasis on health. And so today he's going to talk about uh, technologies that will change the smart environments for us. <laughs> thank you, Larry. And thank you for everyone uh, for having me here. It's great to come and see a lot of the research that you know we tend to read about and cite in our own research. So to meet the people and the researchers behind that is is really good for us to do. So um, I apologize for my voice when I was down in D.C. with uh, C.K. and a few others. I got this nasty cold down in D.C. <laughs> and my my voice was totally gone earlier this week, so it's just starting to come back now. So hopefully it lasts uh, for the presentation. So. So what I want to talk to you today is about some of the research that we're doing back in Toronto around various smart home technologies and other types of devices for older adults. Now, my presentation really is going to start off with a bit of a soapbox. I'm going to actually you know, express my own personal view on kind of the state of the science of technology and aging, what's going on with it, and what needs to change really to move it you know, past the, the kind of stage that we're at right now. Um, so, to begin with, just, you know, I don't, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the background why we're doing this in the rationale. We all know this. We see this in the media every day. You know, the common term that's especially used up in Canada as the rising tide, right? So it kind of, you know, gives you this picture of this large tidal wave of older adults coming at us and it's going to crash over us and sweep us away if we don't do anything. And basically all the reports, not only in Canada and the U.S., but also in Europe and Asia and uh, elsewhere, is all saying the same thing, that... If we don't come up with different solutions, different alternatives on how to provide care to older adults, essentially our healthcare system won't be able to face this challenge anymore. That eventually the healthcare systems won't be able to deal with it, and there's eventually going to be this crash in the way that we provide healthcare to it. Now, a big reason for this is kind of because of a positive thing, but also that's leading to a negative consequence, and that's the fact that there's longer life expectancy now. So, you know, we're seeing people live a lot longer. And because of that, though, we're starting to see older adults live with other diseases and impairments that's kind of beyond your traditional aging-related conditions. So we're starting to see a lot more older adults with things such as dementia or Alzheimer's disease. And in particular, we're starting to see a lot more of these older adults living in, in their own homes with these conditions. So a lot of researchers, including myself in Toronto, people in this room and elsewhere, elsewhere I've been mean, talking about whether technology can be used as a solution. And there's actually been a significant amount of work that's been completed on the use of technology to help support older adults and their caregivers at home. And it's important to stress that when we talk about technology for aging, the end user is just not the older adult. The end user is also the caregivers, the family members, and anyone else who's providing care. So they need to be incorporated into any equation we're doing. Now, this field has been led, obviously, primarily by academics and research labs, such as here, or University of Toronto, or elsewhere, and with some support from industry as well. And we're starting to see more industry get involved in this area of research as well. And one of the main reasons why we feel technology can really play a significant role is this whole thing about moving from this reactive healthcare system or healthcare model to a proactive one. Okay? So right now, typically, we provide this reactive approach where if someone gets sick, someone develops an impairment or disability, we start to provide help. And that's typically done down the acute care setting. Now, these numbers are not specific, but it's really just kind of the general principle here. Now, research has shown that acute care models are very, very expensive and a cost per day and have very low quality of life for the patient or for the older adult. So the question is, can we move up this spectrum through acute care to residential care, eventually to providing care in the person's home or their own communities? And you know, the main premise behind this whole area of research is 
we feel technology allows us to move up this spectrum. Okay. So right now, it's looking like a very rosy picture. Everything's going really well. We're coming up with a lot of new net technologies. But in my mind, there's some significant limitations right now in the field of technology and aging that are preventing it from really moving to that next level. <clears throat> so first and foremost, again, in my personal opinion, the technology for aging landscape is very messy and fragmented. There's a lot of us doing research on this area, a lot of us producing technologies, but not a lot of us talking to each other. And this was a topic down in DC, we were talking about how can we start sharing data, how can we start sharing technology, sensors, software that we're all developing, so we can come together as a cohesive field and start moving things forward. Next, there's very little empirical evidence to prove or disprove the efficacy of these systems. It's very hard for me to answer the question, you know, when people say, well, does this technology work? Is it actually going to allow us to provide care in the person's home? And my answer more often than not is, well, I don't know. There are some studies that show, yes, this does work. But again, those tend to be very small sample sizes, very limited periods of time that technology be using for. But again, no studies have come out and said this technology won't work. So there needs to be a lot more research done in this area in order to start to build up to the, these levels of evidence in order to support us moving forward in this field. Finally, there are very few devices available, and I'm talking about commercially now. And those that are available tend to be quite expensive. Now, you can probably count on one hand the number of kind of large companies out there in North America that provide technology for aging, right? There's Philips, Intel and GE have come together to form a company, and then there's a bunch of smaller ones as well, all producing similar technologies. And these, again, tend to be very, very expensive. They're very expensive because one, there's few companies developing them. Second, it's still a relatively small marketplace compared to other types of industries. And third, as soon as we label anything a healthcare product or an assistive technology, prices skyrocket. We're not at the stage yet in this field where we can call technology for aging a consumer-based product. <clears throat> so if you kind of look at the pros and cons of the technology and aging field and what's out there, you know, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of benefits, there are a lot of pros that have been shown so far. Okay, so it has been shown that this technology can support aging in place. It has been shown through various studies and through anecdotal stories and data collected that it can increase independence of older adults in the home. Technology can ease anxiety, not only of the older adult, but especially of the family members and the caregivers providing support. And there has been research that's shown that it does reduce healthcare costs. There are some great studies out of the UK and Australia that shows things such as home-based physiological monitoring among older adults with congestive heart failure, for example, can save millions of dollars to the healthcare system over a year. Now coming together hand in hand with the benefits are some of the disadvantages. A lot of the technologies that are out there are difficult to operate. Now, a lot of them tend to be difficult to operate by someone who may be well trained or well versed in the area, let alone given to an older adult or a caregiver who may have no experience with technology, or an older adult who may have cognitive impairment, obviously, and do not have the full capacity to learn a new technology, learn a new system, and apply in their daily lives. A lot of the systems tend to be very complex to customize. Okay? If you're developing technology for an older adult with dementia, you know, dementia is a very dynamic disease. It changes you know, on a very rapid basis. We've seen older adults in some of our trials where their needs, their preferences, their abilities change, not just day to day, but you know, from morning to afternoon. And in order to accommodate that, we don't want the technologies have to go in, or a program or a developer have to go into the technology and reprogram the variables, set up new um, aspects of the technology, et cetera, to meet the changing needs of the person. As a result of this complexity in the, in the customization and setup, a lot of these technologies are being shown to increase workload as opposed to decrease them. It comes from the caregiver perspective. Right? You need to remember, we're going to a caregiver or a family member who's maybe providing 20, 30, 40, sometimes even more hours of care per week to a loved one. And we're saying to them, well, hold on a second, we have a technology here that's going to help solve your problem. But by the way, here's the manual for it. You need to set it up, and this is how you go and you have to change the variables and customize it on a weekly basis. Okay, so that's not the approach we want to do. We want to be able to decrease workload, obviously, through this new technological support. As I mentioned before, not a lot of commercially available, so there's not a lot of marketplace competitiveness out there. There's no reason for a lot of the commercial products that are currently available to change because there's not a lot of option available at this current time. And as a result, high cost. 
Now, when we talk to older adults and their caregivers in terms of why do they not like using technology that's currently existing, it really comes down to one item, though, one big issue, and that's stigma. Now, this slide's a bit over the top, I fully admit it. But at the end of the day, this is the state of the art of technology for aging. Okay, your classic personal emergency response system that works on a push button. These technologies do not work. The companies themselves have said and have published 70% of their clients do not wear the push button because they don't remember to wear it, the stigma involved, or a, various, a host of other reasons. 75% of the clients who do wear the button don't push it if they have a fall or have an injury. Again, they're unconscious, they're too injured, they don't understand they have to push the button, or again, they just don't want to do anything. And typically the answer we get back from older adults we talk about is, well, I just didn't want to bother anyone. Or I'm afraid that if I push this button, it means me leaving my home. Okay. Yet again, this is the probably the best selling product for older adults that's out there. Yet it's inherent with a whole, a whole bunch of problems that we all know about. So the question is, what do we need to do to move from this to technology for aging that can actually really hopefully make a difference and be acceptable to the older adult population? And this is where this whole notion of disruption comes into play. We need to disrupt the current ways of thinking. We need to disrupt the current marketplace and come up with new solutions, new approaches that's going to allow us to change the current state of the science, the state of the art. Now, I'm sure we've all heard of the term disruptive technology. It's, again, one of those key buzzwords that's in the media these days. But essentially, you know, it's any kind of product that when introduced either transforms markets, creates new markets, or destroys existing markets for other technology. Right? So two of your classic examples of a disruptive technology is the digital camera. When the digital camera came out, it forced the entire camera um, um, group of manufacturers and the whole product line to change their way of thinking and change their products as well, or else be left behind. Okay? Another tip was the smartphone. As soon as the smartphone came out, again, this was a disruptive technology to the cell phone marketplace, changed everything that happened now. And cell phones now are radically different than they were before the smartphone came out. So my notion here is in technology and aging, what we're doing, we need to do the exact same thing. We need to come up with technologies that's essentially going to disrupt the current personal emergency response systems, the medication reminding devices, you know, all the other devices that are out there that are just not cutting it for our current older adult population. So the goal in our lab is actually to take this concept of disruptive technologies and to move it forward in order to develop new technologies or smart home systems that can enable aging in place no matter the context or the activity. And what I mean by this is essentially we want to develop a smart home, again, kind of looking down the road, that's a complete integration of all these various technologies, that no matter what you want to do, it understands your preferences, understands your needs, understands your capabilities, and changes accordingly. So for example, we may have a house that recognizes that maybe I have a cognitive impairment, I'm having difficulty completing a self-care activity, such as hand washing, toothbrushing, game dress, whatever it may be realizes what step I've been, I'm stuck at and then gives me a reminder to do so. And I'll show you an example of that technology. <clears throat> it may realize it's time for my medication, give me a prompt to do so. And again, I'm not talking about your typical medication or mind device that's out there just basically beeps at 2 p.m. at me and I have no clue what that beeping means. A technology, again, that can understand my context. It understands that maybe you know it's 10 a.m., time for me to take my meds, yet I'm about to go for a walk. And it knows I'm going for a walk because of the sensors in the home, et cetera. At that point, the system would reason, okay, well, it's time for his meds, but he's going for a walk. We know he typically goes for a walk for about an hour. Can we wait for him to get back, or should we give him the prompt right now? Okay, so the system can reason about that. Detects I've fallen or I've become injured, and calls for help automatically, and again, without any type of devices or technologies on me, or without me having to manually activate anything. Or I may just realize I'm sleeping longer. I'm going to the bathroom twice as many times, or not as many times as I typically do. And it may just ask me, Alex, are you feeling okay? Or may, you know, ask my neighbor just to give me a call and check in on me. Again, while maintaining my privacy and my independence by not sending data out to the neighbor, but just, you know, again, giving them a prompt to check in because something may be going on based on what's being observed. So the question is then, how do we do disruption? How do we disrupt things? And again, thinking about kind of what we've done and what you know my personal approach has been, really, disruption requires 
you know, two things. It essentially requires some kind of inspiration to do something, to actually make that move and disrupt the way things are being done. And often then it requires new ways of thinking. So let me start with my inspiration. So this is Diane and her husband Robin. I met Robin 16 years ago. It was right before I started my graduate work, and I'll try to decide what to do. And Robin's wife, Diane, was in her early 50s, had full-blown Alzheimer's, very early onset Alzheimer's. And he was talking to me and saying, well, so difficult taking care of her at home, but I don't want to put her into a long-term care facility. And you know, when we were talking more about this, and fully admit this is over drinks probably in a bar somewhere, we were talking about this, and he said, it's so tough taking her to the bathroom and staying with her all times, giving her reminders and prompts and everything to do. She gets so upset, she gets so embarrassed. And as part of this conversation, he turned to me and said, wouldn't it be neat if a computer could do all this? And based on that story, based on that personal account, that was my inspiration to think, well, yeah, why can't a computer do all this? Why are we still doing things the old way? Why are we still kind of taking the same approaches that we've been doing at all this point? There needs to be a better way. So that was my inspiration that kind of led me towards the various research I'm describing to you here. That was my inspiration. In terms of new ways of thinking, we started coming up with this whole premise of, well, if we're developing these technologies and we want people to use them, and we know that a big reason why these technologies are abandoned often is because it increases the workload, increases the burden on the families and the users. So why should there be any interaction whatsoever? Can we come up with an approach to technology where essentially all the stuff that we're talking about can be done without any type of manual input or interaction by the user, including the family member and the carrier? And this is where we kind of came up with this term of zero effort technology. Now, when I talk about zero effort technology, I'm not saying we're removing the human or the caregiver completely from the loop, because that's impossible. But the technology allows the caregivers and the family members to be as involved as they feel they could or that they want to be in terms of interacting with the technologies, interacting with the, the systems that's being provided, et cetera. The whole notion of zero effort technologies in, in our approach is essentially we take the technology, it's installed into the home, you turn it on, and that's it. Right? And these are very much in line with a lot of things that's going on here. Technologies that can learn about people using artificial intelligence, et cetera, can use sensors to collect this information, and again, can adapt and change to the person's needs and to the caregiver's needs as much as it's required. So in order to apply this whole approach of zero effort technologies, we've really uh, taken two different fields from computer science and applied in our research, and this is nothing new that's going on here as well. So the first one is the whole concept of pervasive computing. Right? Does everyone know what pervasive computing is? <coughs> yeah? Okay, so I don't need to go in depth about this. Then. We all understand pervasive computing essentially allows us then to use various types of technologies, various types of displays, various types of in infrastructure to implement the technologies into our lives naturally. We need to do the exact same thing with these types of technologies that we're talking about for older adults. The next approach option is AI, again, you guys are no strangers to AI. And again, we use a variety of different approaches within AI, including uh, vision and sensing. Our main sensor of choice is computer vision. We do everything with computer vision in our work, as you'll see. The reason why we use computer vision is, one, that's where our interests lie from a theoretical point of view. But two, we know that there's a lot of great work happening on motion sensors and other types of devices, which eventually should all come together at some point via hybrid system. We do quite a bit of work in machine learning. We started doing new work in speech recognition with older adults uh, to the point where we've actually developed our own database of older adult voices um, under healthy conditions and under duress um, so we can build better speech recognition models and that library is freely available to any researchers in the area uh, through us. And obviously we do quite a bit of work in decision making. And a lot of the same techniques I've seen going on here. So the big question is, what is pervasive computing? What does artificial intelligence do for us? What does it do for this field to allow us to move these technologies forward? So first and foremost, it allows us not to embed the systems into the user's life. Right? This is the critical aspect of a zero effort technology, seamlessly into my own life, so that essentially I can go about my daily business, about my daily routine, and it's doing what it needs to do. Second, it allows us to hide the sensors. Okay, we've not achieved this in our group or in other groups that great, but our sensors are still visible. Okay, but hopefully by through the use of these concepts and these advanced concepts from uh, pervasive computing and AI, hopefully we can start embedding these more into the environment so that they're not visible, hence reducing the stigma of these types of technologies. Next, obviously learn and adapt to the user's context, because this is critical of any of the systems we're talking about here. 
provide timely and appropriate help. This is crucial, especially when you deal with older adults with cognitive impairment. You don't want a technology that's always going to be prompting the person. You don't, you don't want an active system. The whole adage of you don't use it, you lose it is absolutely true when it comes to cognition. So you want technologies to allow the person to do as much as they can before intervening. Okay. And finally, obviously, making data available. And, and making data available is not only important for these systems so that they can learn about the person to adapt, but collecting useful data that will be good from a clinician's point of view, from a family member's point of view, from the doctor's point of view, wherever it may be, so that they can get an understanding of what's going on with that person. And while there's been a lot of research happening in this area, we haven't done a significant focus on this whole data as aspect, especially around data visualization. How should the data be processed? How should it be mined? How should it be visualized for it to be meaningful to different types of people at different moments of time? All right, so at this point, then, what I want to do is show you some examples of projects that we're doing in Toronto. Does anyone have any questions about this so far? Great. Normally, it takes me a lot longer to explain pervasive career in AI. Since this audience is so well versed, we're kind of just flying right through here. So, the first technology is, what is the coach. So, this is our probably our longest running project. And this is um, a system that was developed to help older adults with dementia get through the task of various types of activities that they live in or self care activities, providing prompts and cues as necessary. Now, the coach, we're starting to develop it for various domains of self care personal grooming, medication, self care activities, nutrition, daily reminders, and, and getting to finances as well. Where so far we built prototypes, we started testing for personal grooming, um, self-care activities, and nutrition and meal preparation. The example I'm going to show you is more around the, uh, it's kind of a personal grooming and self-care, the example of hand washing I described to you. But we've also done toothbrushing, um, uh, dressing, nutrition we're getting to meal preparation, as well as determining the dietary intake that older adults to have as well, prompting them accordingly. So the coach is made up of three different modules. Uh, we have the tracking, the planning, and the prompting. So as I said, the tracking module is all based on computer vision. So what we do for hand washing, for example, is we track the hand locations, as well as the objects that the person is interacting with. So whether they're interacting with the towel, the soap, the toothbrush, in the case of toothbrush, whatever it may be. And again, this is without any marks. This is all markerless tracking based on just fairly simple uh, shape and motion and color models that, that we, we put together. So the tracking module essentially determines what the person is doing, what step of hand washing or toothbrush or whatever it may be they're completing. Right? So for hand washing, for example, we've broken hand washing down to the five essential steps that have to happen, including all the different pathways that you can take in hand washing to successfully come out with clean hands. And you'd be surprised that there's a, a multitude of different ways that you can do that. Now, the hand positions and the objects you're interacting with then pass on to the planning module. For the planning, we actually use a partially observable Markov decision process, a POMDP. Now, yeah, I'm not going to go into POMDP at this point, but uh, for anyone interested, just feel free to ask me. So using the POMDP, what it allows us to do, though, is to model uncertainty. So as you know, when you're observing someone, whether you have 100 sensors or 5 sensors, you're going to have a lot of noise, a lot of ambiguity in your data coming in. So the POMDP allows us to model that ambiguity through the use of prob probabilities and statistical models in order to take that into account our model. What the POMDP also allows us to do is to model hidden states of the person. So not only does the system look at hand position and object interaction and where they are within the sequence, we also try to model the level of awareness of the person based on observations of them interacting with the system, interacting with the prompts, and we also try to model the level of dementia of the person as well. Again, just based on these simple observations. And just as a side note, uh, we haven't published this yet, but what we actually found in our last set of trials that I'll show you is we were actually able to correlate our estimation of dementia from the POMDP with the mini mental state examination score, uh, so the MMSC, with a correlation of about 0.85. So if you think about that as kind of an offshoot, this could also potentially become a very powerful diagnostic tool that by just observing an older adult do something like wash their hands or brush their teeth, maybe we can actually track their progression through change in and decline in their cognition. The next thing then that happens then is it goes to the prompting module. And this is where it determines whether a prompt is needed, whether a system is required by the person. And the critical aspect in the prompting module is that it can adapt and change the types of prompts being given to the person based on past history and experience. So the prompting module actually has built into various levels of detail. So it can start off with a very general prompt, such as dry your hands or use the toothpaste, to more specific ones, such as addressing the person by name, 
describing the object they need to use, to the eventual maximum level, which is a prompt, verbal prompt plus a video being shown to the person on how to complete the, the particular step. And again, the system learns about the person and their abilities and changes <coughs> these prompts accordingly. Not only can it increase the level of detail, it can also decrease if we see that learning is happening. <clears throat> now the other critical part of the prompting module is this whole thing about keeping the human caregiver in the loop. So the system obviously will give a prompt and if it doesn't work, it'll prompt again, it'll prompt again, maybe change the level of detail. But at some point the system will just stop prompting. And at that point we'll call the caregiver to come in, say what step the person needs help with, and then the system would take over again. So I'll show a video now from one of our latest trials. This woman here had a mini mental score of about 3 out of 30, so she was quite severe in terms of her level of dementia. I'm just going to show you a small snippet here. Oh, no, 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 Oh, God, that's so good. Okay, so essentially what happened there is the system recognized that she was stalling on the step of rinsing the soap off her hands, which she always did. So it gave her a prompt to move on to the next thing. Now, this was probably about 10, day, 10 or 12 days into the trial with her. So it actually learned that she always needed to be addressed by name, and she always needed to be shown the video to complete the steps. Now, while we, the system learned to show the video, we still have no idea if it's the video that got her through the task, or the video may have just captured her attention to listen to the prompt to move on to the next thing. Either way, she always needed this video kind of turned on in order to help her. Now, the other interesting thing you saw there is how she interacted with the system. Okay? And this was actually common across all of our six subjects in this one trial. So it was a small trial, but uh, we tested for 60 days uh, with each person. And all of them would have this conversation back and forth with the system. Now, an interesting kind of, again, side note on this is originally our prompts never included praise. When we talked to professional caregivers and we said, well, do you include praise in your prompting? The majority of the seven said no. They said, you know, we, we're, we're not in there to have this long conversation. We want to get them in and out. We have a lot of patience to eat, whatever else. So we never included praise. When we didn't include praise, we didn't see the conversation happen. They basically just listened to the prompt and they could perform the step. A PhD student of mine, uh, Roseanne Wilson, who just graduated from speech language pathology, her whole thesis was on understanding the communication strategies between older adults with Alzheimer's and caregivers so that we can actually determine the types of prompts that we should use in this type of technology. And her big finding was that you know the number three overall use strategy was praise. And at that point we added it, and that's when we started seeing this more natural interaction. What this natural interaction also though, led to though was some frustration on the parts of the user. So a lot of times the frustration happened is when the person would say, you know, what was that, or where's the towel? And at this point, the system doesn't have the capability to respond back. We didn't have any kind of um, ASR or any kind of speech recognition in the system. And at that point, a lot of the, the patients um, or the users would say things like, oh, like now you decide not to say something, or those <laughs> kinds of comments, and it really frustrated them. So this is now being led to some new research we're doing around adding natural dialogue um, into this type of technology, so it can be more natural back and forth, just as you would have with a caregiver. Like I said, we did conduct a study, I'm sorry, over 40 days, not 60 days, where what we did, and this is over in NF6, this is the, the summary data, I'm not showing the individual data at this point, and what we did is we had a baseline phase where we just had them go perform hand washing with their caregivers as they typically would <coughs> during the A phases, and then we introduced the coach system during the B phases. And what you see is during the A phases, on average, they were able to complete around four, the five steps on their own. If you looked at individual data, what you'd see is there's a huge standard deviation there. We'd have people down in the zero to one range and some are always perfect in hand washing. So it was a big range. The interesting thing here is when the coach was introduced is only really when we saw perfect performance across everyone. So even those people who are only performing zero or one step out of five on their own, were able to complete all five in response to the coach prompting system. Now, I don't have the data here for caregiver workload, but the interesting thing we saw there is that on average, without the coach system, caregivers were spending anywhere from seven to 10 minutes per person to get them to wash their hands. Now, these caregivers are looking after eight to 10 people. 
you figure they're going to wash their hands maybe a minimum of three times, minimum. That's a lot of time a caregiver spent just for this kind of mundane task of hand washing. When the coach was introduced, this was under 30 seconds on average that they were spending with, with the patient during this hand washing task. So in terms of some new work, I said we're expanding other ADL, the toothbrush and nutrition. Here's an example of the uh, new computer vision models we're building for, um, for toothbrushing. Um, we're also then getting ready to do installation of the actual home to so do a 24-7 deployment off of the technology. We actually just finished a long-term deployment of this technology in a, in a uh, memory clinic in Toronto. And the point of that is we want to see, well, can we use this technology not for specific people, but can we build one model, one vision-based model for hand tracking, one prompting um, plan uh, module, and would that work across a wide range of people? So we had about 40 different older adults come in and use the system over about uh, a two to three months, about two and a half months the system was running. Um, and what we found is the answer was no. The system failed miserably. The fact that we weren't customizing the prompts and addressing people by name and everything else, just the system was not working. People were ignoring it, a lot of the prompts. So that may be an artifact of, you know, it was not a rigorous study that we did. We really just did an installation. We collected the same data that I showed you before. Um, yep. So, uh, so you said that the system failed miserably in the context of prompting. Yeah. How about the other aspect? The tracking actually was fine. Yeah, so um, the tracking was fine, um, which surprised us. That we basically found, we, we, I have one graduate student for some reason who has the skin color of all men and women. We, we, it's amazing, we train the model on his skin color and it works for everyone for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why, it's like, but, so we trained it on him and, this, and the skin color model worked no problem. It was the context of the prompting that didn't work. So it also came down to the whole thing about changing the, the sequence of steps. So. Uh, one thing our system also does is it can change the order that it prompts in because it learns what, what um, sequence a person is comfortable with, right? So a big issue with dementia, as we probably all know, is, is familiarity. You know, you don't want to change the environment. You don't want to change the sequence of what the person did because if they're familiar with doing it, then that's what they're going to be building upon. So we want to learn that as well. The fact that we are forcing people into different sequences also really frustrated some of the users. So. Great. Any other questions there? All right, so the second technology is our fall detection system. So this is not for older adults dementia per se, but for older adults in general. But we did start this project with dementia in mind and the whole fact of you know, what happens if they don't remember to wear their push button. Right? <clears throat> so what we developed here is this intelligent hands-free emergency response system. It's actually a unit that's installed in, in on the ceiling. What you see here actually is a picture of our home lab in Toronto. Um, and here's the unit installed and she's just an actor. This is not a real Toronto. Um, the key thing here is this hands-free component, right? So again, you don't need to wear anything, you don't need to manually trigger the device, you don't need to do anything to set it off if you have a fall or an accident. So some of the key system features is, again, no need for the push button or manual intervention. Once a fall is detected, it then uses speech recognition to actually have a conversation with the person to determine how injured they are and who to call for help. Uh, the privacy and time of the user is maintained, so there's no images being sent out, there's no human operator here. No health data is being sent out of the home itself unless the person gives permission or can't give permission because they're too severely injured. And what we've done is the unit that you saw a picture of there before actually is all self-contained. So in there is the camera, the processor, the microphone, the speaker, and a smoke detector as well. And so all the processing is done locally. Uh, so again, there's no images being transmitted even from system to, to device to device within the home itself. And finally, because we do the speech recognition aspect to determine who to call, you actually don't need now this costly call center, which is the current model of a lot of the products that are out there. So you don't need to be paying your $40 a month. Now, while this is a great idea, this is a crushing blow to us commercially. <laughs> no company wants to touch this product right now because their whole business model, Philip's whole business model, Lifeline's whole business model is on the $40 a month that they get. And now we're saying, well, you don't need that anymore. So we're public enemy number one right now. Hence why Phillips and Lifeline severed all ties with this project. Well, we're still moving forward. We think we have a new partner coming up. So schematically, the way the system works, again, is using vision. We track what we call the occupant dynamic. So we actually don't track the fall itself. Okay? We actually look at the posture of the person. So we classify if the person is standing up, if they've crouched down to tie their shoe or pick something up, or if they've fallen on the ground in various postures. So it's quite easy for us to actually test this system because all we need to do is just have grasses gently lie down on the ground and not throw themselves. You know, 
I, I don't tell them that until after I see one of them build themselves on the ground. I say, oh, by the way, you need to do that. But, uh, so it's quite easy for us to test. Based on that, then, we determine, you know, has the person fallen in the location of the occupant within the room? So essentially, you have to install one of these devices in every room, and based on that, we obviously know where they are, and we know the relative location within the room as well, based on the computer vision model. So if a fall has happened, it then goes to the dialogue manager, and this is where we do the speech recognition. Now, the dialogue manager is actually based on the exact dialogue that a lifeline or Phillips operator would use. They are trained essentially to ask simple questions where you can get a yes or no answer from it. So this is what our system does as well. <clears throat> We're currently working on a more sophisticated natural language model in order to determine you know, more free speech and also to classify level of injury. And that's where that speech database or corpus that we built comes into play. Based on that, based on the dialogue, it then summons the appropriate systems. And this could be you know, to a neighbor, it could be to a family member, it could be right to 911, whoever's programmed in the system. And our back end can essentially send a text message, an automated phone call, or an email, or all three to whoever is being uh, called. Once that call goes out, for example, I may get an automated phone call. It'll say, you know, so-and-so has fallen and needs help. Push one to be connected live to them. I push one. Connects me back into the unit as a hands-free device. This was great during the development phase because it was my cell phone programmed in. So about 30 times a day, I'd be getting these phone calls on my phone saying that my software developer has fallen and he's not home and he needs help. So we had to switch that up. Now, the other part of research we're working on now is this whole long-term behavior analysis. So essentially, if there's no fall, the system continues to monitor what's going on, your movements, your motions, if you're in bed, if you're out of bed, whatever it may be, to build these, these models of your long-term behavior. And again, very similar to the work that's happened down here that we're hoping to start collaborating on more and more here. So here's a video of the system working. <coughs> the way the system works at this point. So I said the new work we're doing with the more natural dialogue is to be able to really shorten that whole conversation. Um, so it's, you know, we're looking at this thing, what they call speaker turns. How many turns does it take between the injured person and the operator to get help? And you know, we've analyzed a bunch of 911 calls and uh, calls from um, a PERS company. And essentially, obviously, the greater the injury or it's more severe, the number of speaker turns is far less. And so that's the kind of model we want to follow as well by having a better understanding of how injured the person is. So last year we did a trial of this in, in several homes, um, and the good news is the true positive rate was 100%. So we always saw falls that occurred. Now these are simulated falls in the home. So every in every home we installed this and we asked everyone, okay, a few times a day, just fall for us in various positions and, and postures and see what happens, and we got 100%. Now, from a computer vision perspective, our false positive rate was 0.00126%. That's fantastic, but that's because we collect over 3 million frames. If you put that into practical terms, that trains into about five false alarms a day. So five times a day, on average, our system is asking the person, are you okay? And the person is saying, I'm fine, and the system shut off. So there are no false alarms leaving the house, but being asked five times a day if you're okay gets very, very annoying. Just ask my wife. She was one of the <laughs> participants. So this kind of, though, pushes the whole notion of real-world trials and how important they are in this area. Testing this in our home lab, which is a fully operational house, but within our, in our hospital, didn't come up with scenarios that caused these false alarms. The majority of these false alarms were actually caused because in, a few, in one of the houses, it was installed in a room with a big window, okay, and there was a big tree outside the window, and the sun would shine and cast a shadow of the tree inside the house. 
That wasn't the false alarm. It was when it was windy, the tree would move, the shadow would move, make it look like someone rolling around the ground, and that set off the system. Those kinds of real world conditions we never would have even thought about simulating in, in a lab environment. So it's very, very important for us to just get the technology out there, even though we knew it wasn't 100% ready, in order to determine some of these real world things that may cause some problems. So we fixed now the majority of these false alarms and we're in a much better state now of our, in terms of our, um, our prototype. So to finish off, I want to talk about some new work that we're doing now, kind of a new direction we're moving in, and kind of, you know, one of these grand challenges that I'm posing to the smart home system. Now, I call it a grand challenge, because when I say a challenge, no one listens. When I say grand challenge, everyone's like, oh, it's a grand challenge. I should listen to this. A big issue right now in terms of smart home technologies is there's still just a collection of devices that we install in someone's house. It doesn't go back to that initial concept I talked about hiding the sensors, removing the stigma, making it a natural part of our, our lives. And so what we're proposing is how can we take these technologies, how can we take these sensors and build them into the house itself? And when I talk about into the house itself, I'm talking about into the actual building material. So the house is now your sensor, right? So imagine that instead of having fall detect, or imagine that every brick is your, is your computing unit, right? So as you build up your house, you're building up your infrastructure to support all these technologies. Instead of having our fall detection unit, again, the ceiling material itself has the sensors built into it, so that the entire ceiling can be tracking you, right? Just not those individual units. As you stand there in the bathroom to brush your teeth or you walk across your dining room floor, whatever it may be, we're collecting your heart rate, your blood pressure, your respiration automatically, again, without any devices being put on you. Okay? So this is an area of work that we're getting into now that we call ambient physiological monitoring. And what we're trying to do is to take all the different sensors that I've been describing to you, such as stereo vision cameras and other things such as um, you know, infrared thermometry, smart pressure sensors, everything else, and build this into the building material itself. So this is in collaboration with the Faculty of Architecture, Faculty of the University of Toronto, plus others. So obviously there's a huge design challenge here. How do we take the components of these sensing devices and build them actually into the commonly found household objects? How do we build them into doorknobs? How do we build them into handrails? How do we build them into pieces of furniture? So that I can just go about my daily routine of getting up and going to the bathroom and brushing my teeth and going down and having breakfast. Well, at the same time, this physiological data is being collected about me on that continuous basis. And again, with zero effort for myself. So how do we package these sensors appropriately? How do we make them cost effective? How do we make them easy to install? Again, my kind of long term, this is now probably 20 year, 30 year vision, um, if that is, how can we make these things that you can go to Home Depot, buy these floor tiles, buy these doorknobs, install them in your house, and then you have your technologies built in. So we have been looking at various types of sensors to measure various types of physiological parameters. Um, our target group at this point is older adults congestive heart failure. That's our main study that we are trying to get funding for to do. So we're looking at things at heart rate, such as embedded reflective uh, spirometry sensors, respiration rate through pressure sensor arrays, blood pressure through uh, built into floor tiles, embedded ECG sensors, load cells, things like that. Um, we're looking at body weight obviously, which is a big thing. And then one of the other big things we're trying to build in is the motion as well. So there's been a lot of research done on physiological parameters and capture physiological data. A lot of research done on motion capture data and activity-based data, but very little research on bringing these two together, right? So for example, you know, there's situations where Data gets sent of an older adult's blood pressure, you know, through a remote device, which they're currently using now in the um, uh, cardiac rehab program in Toronto. And the blood pressure read and the heart rate readings are kind of off the chart. And the doctor calls them up, so well, I got these measurements and I'm very concerned; they're very, very high. Why is, is that? And after you know probing the older adult a bit more, they discover it's because the older adult just walked up the stairs and then took their heart rate reading. Well, obviously, if you don't understand the context within which the measurements are being taken then some of this data may be really just absolutely useless to the, to the clinician or to whoever. So can we combine the work we're doing on activity sensing and monitoring with the physiological data to build a better model? So we started developing a couple prototypes. We've been working on a smart floor tile. And so what we've done is we developed a floor tile that even if you're wearing shoes and socks, we can still get your heart rate, blood pressure, and respiration rate. And we're using a concept called BCG or ballistic cardiogram. Anyone hear BCG before? It's a really old concept, actually. We found it in a paper from the 1920s. And all BCG says is, essentially, you know, as your heart pumps blood out, it does it with a certain amount of force, 
and there's an equal and opposite force that goes to the ground, right? Newton's law. And so if we can measure that force through some kind of sensing signal processing, we can actually then translate that BCG into things such as said blood pressure, respiration rate, and everything else. So this is our first stab of a floor tile. It looks like a piece of plastic glass with a bunch of stuff on it right now. This is the job of the architect now to take this and to turn this into something that actually looks decent. But some, from preliminary trials we've done, results have been very positive. So for example, using the concept of BCG to look at heart rate over a duration of 90 seconds, when compared to the gold standard of taking heart rate at this point, we actually only have a mean error rate of about 1.5% between our floor tile, again, wearing shoes and socks, and your current gold standard. So we're getting ready now to launch a larger trial where we're gonna recruit 50 young, healthy adults and collect these various parameters to see how well the system does. I'll finish off now on showing this video. This is another interesting project where we're trying to collect heart rate and ECG through clothing. So that first one's sitting on the sofa, and here you see we're actually getting his ECG. And from that, we can derive heart rate, blood pressure, everything else. And all it is, is as you'll sit up, are these two copper electrodes that are behind them on this cushion. Now, there's a whole host of signal processing and, and circuits that we built to do this. But again, this is showing the concept that this can actually be done. You don't need things physically on the person. Again, hopefully, we can build these into the natural environment and the natural objects that a person will interact with. So finally, in summary, hopefully I've shown you, and I'm sure you've seen from the research going on here in the various groups, that innovation, disruption, technology, and aging does exist. And, and much of it is happening within academia, within the research labs, but these, and these projects are slowly starting to gather the evidence that's required. But tech transfer and moving these things out of the lab into the commercial marketplace is still very, very difficult. And in order for this to happen, the current landscape that I've described to you really needs to change for these innovations to make it to the marketplace. And again, in my opinion, there's four things that need to happen. First, we need to accept risk more. Companies in this space, consumers in this space, need to understand that the technologies we're coming up with may look different than the push button, may operate differently, but could have a huge impact on their lives. And economically, have a huge impact on sales and whatever else is important to the company. We need to change the delivery model. And again, take these technologies from the assisted technology, healthcare, medical device space and move them to that personal electronics, personal consumer product. Why can't we go buy these things in Radio Shack and Best Buy? I was going to say Canadian store, I didn't realize you know, <laughs> Best Buy, Home Depot. And take control of the products that you're going to be using in your own environment. Obviously, change the funding models. Okay? This is not only from the whole aspect of get rid of the $40 a month service charge that's needed, but again, how do we fund these products so that they get in the hands of the users? Right? You hear these cases every day still of you know, with new apps and stuff that come out that may cost $50 to do the same thing that a technology cost $500 does, yet you don't get funding for the $50 app, but you'll get funding for the $500 piece of equipment. That needs to change. And finally, obviously, don't fear competition. Again, these companies that are out there really do have a big fear of these new products coming out of the marketplace. You know, they've told me this. I've had meetings with a few of them, and this is what I hear. So they need to get rid of this fear of competition, allow these new products to come on to actually make it a bit more of a competitive marketplace. Before I add, I need to plug Resna. So I'm also president of Resna, which is the Re-M Engineering Assistive Technology Society of North America. The conference is in Seattle this year, co-located with the International Conference on Rehab Robotics. Um, so there's going to be joint sessions and stuff going on with them. It's close by to you guys, relatively speaking. This is a great place that we're starting to build up this whole area of reach of smart homes, technology for aging, be a significant part of Resna. So please consider um, applying to this. And I'll finish off with my contact information. This is, I apologize, a very self-made video of our home lab tour that I made. It kind of makes you sick if you watch it too long because <laughs> my camera's not great. But again, thanks for having me. It's been great to visit and see all the work going on here. So thank you. Any questions? So um, I saw that most of your technologies had uh, computer vision component. Yep. So to what extent were your participants uh, willing to adopt this technology considering privacy issues which kind of inhibits the usage of this yep. technology? So what we found is we described to them and showed them what the data looks like and educated them on how the technology works and the fact that no human operator, no data leaving, 
they're all then very accepting. So we've never had it in a situation, and we even have these like in the bathroom, right? Um, oh, so you have the um, uh, call monitoring even in bathrooms? Yeah. Um, so once they understood that and, and saw how the, the technology worked, we didn't have a problem after that. So. And we have to do the same thing with the IRBs too, right? We have to educate the IRBs in terms of this is what actually happened. We show them data samples and we actually show them the technology working. And then again, they kind of get over some of their stresses of uh, stressors of, of having cameras in the home. So. I want to say sincerely thank you for your presentations, which was uh, really informative. Thank you. I have two questions, and here is my first question. Uh, in designing new technology in the context of Chevron te technology, what should be the security and privacy, privacy design goal, in your opinion? Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> essentially, privacy security needs to be part of the entire product development from start to finish. Right? Like, it needs to... We need, to, we need to consider privacy and security and what we design as a key design criteria and not just an afterthought as it typically does. There's an interesting, um, in Ontario, so where I'm from, there's the Information Privacy Commissioner's Office and they've actually produced this guideline called Privacy by Design. And they have these seven key concepts on how to build privacy and security into information technologies. Um, so I actually suggest it's actually a, a fairly good document to take a look at to get an understanding of how you can do that. And they talk about you know, end-to-end uh, -end life cycles of products, how you deal with, you know, when the technology is thrown out, what happens in the data and how you deal with that kind of issue and stuff. But really, it can't be an afterthought, right, anymore, so. Yeah. My second question is just, an, is just an addendum to the first one. And how do we uh, balance security and privacy with safety and efficacy? Um, it's not easy, I really. <laughs> like asking tough questions. Really, you know, you need to try to leave as much control in the hands of the person with the understanding that once the person loses that control or loses the ability to consent, that the technology then needs to take over at some level, right? Now, the key thing is that the person, the user, understands at what level is the system going to take over and override their autonomy at some point, right? So, again, it comes down to education and building into the system. So, with our fall detection system, if it asks the person, are you okay, and there's no response, or the system doesn't understand the response with a certain amount of confidence, it'll re-ask the question. If there's still no response at that point, the system overrides and says, okay, let's call someone in to check on it. Same thing that if the person falls, and the system says, are you okay, and they say, yeah, I'm fine, but the system still detects they're on the ground. So will ask again, are you okay? If you say, oh, I'm fine. The third time, the system says, well, this person's still lying on the ground. At that point, again, it needs to override and call in whoever's on the call list to come check in on the person. It's all about leaving as much control in the hands of the person <coughs> as possible. That's more clarification. So I thought some of your technologies use a lot of ASR. So are you using any standard available two packages to do that, or have you developed your own ASR packages? Um, so the ASR we're, right now we're basing off is Sphinx. Sphinx. Yeah, out of Carnegie Mellon. Okay. And then all of our vision stuff is based off of OpenCV. So we try to use as much off the shelf open access software as possible. So, yeah. one question I have is with any vision system, there's going to be some issues to face in terms of occlusion and lighting, and you've dealt with some of those. But now that you're starting to design, for example, force sensors in the floor, will there still be a need for computer vision? Yeah, I think uh, again, I think at the end of the day, it's going to be a mix of all these sensors working together. So, because again, you know, it may it may not be feasible anytime soon to basically, you know, have these floor tiles ever in the house. But it may be feasible in the next five years to have floor tiles that essentially are, you know, inexpensive enough that you can buy two or three of them and install them just in your house, in your in your bathroom or something. So, you know, we think the cameras can also help fill in a lot of data of what's going on. From a research perspective, also the cameras approach is great too because it provides us all kind of ground truth and baseline data, right? So we know exactly what's going on. So. You know, we've played around with other types of sensors, uh, like RFID-based things like that, and we've essentially kept running our camera system as well to, to, to check the other data. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of these technologies are kind of in the newer stage of development, but with either your ambient physiological major, the monitoring, or the like fall technology, mm -hmm. have you tested any of it with animals in the house? Um, yes. Small dogs are fine, cats are fine, big dogs are a problem. 
Now we can put a, a quick hack into that and say, okay, well, you know, we know the color of the dog's collar or mark the dog's collar and then say, if you see this color, it's just the animal. But that poses a problem. It also still poses a problem that if a bunch of us gather together and stay very still, it sets it off. So we're only doing 2D vision here. We've not gone to the Kinect, we haven't gone to a 3D camera on this, which would obviously simplify this problem a lot. But our goal right now is to each one of those units will retail for $100. So to do that, we need to stay with the cheapest components possible, which is still at this point, you know, standard 2D CCD chips that we're just getting off the shelf, right? So, yep. Have you tried uh, going around and forming some strategic partnerships with some of the companies like Microsoft who you know, their, their new product, right, Windows 8, is kind of a seamless application where you're going to take it everywhere with you. Uh, Google's obviously interested in the same thing. It seems like uh, maybe <clears throat> some of these people who already have technologies like the Connect or Apple with Siri or you know, Google, Android with S-Voice, uh, they would be interested in, in at least partially funding some of this research. Yeah, we've tried to develop some partnerships. The strongest partnership we've actually developed is with the Connect group at Microsoft. So. Um, we talked with them a lot and they sent us a bunch of connects and whatever else that uh, we've now wherever we have a fall detection unit we also have a connect camera up there now just so we can start collecting the stereo data uh, we also have been doing quite a bit of work with the connect camera as part of other projects around um, automated balance assessments in the home so do an automated like sit the stands and gate speed and everything else so that's all based on the connect as well so they're probably our strongest relationship right now um, in terms of other people you know, we've talked to people, but nothing really has, has come out of it so far. Yep. So I have a question. You were talking about moving away from assisted and into more of the consumer electronics, and obviously you have to either get around the regulatory agencies or re-educate them. Yep. How do you see the technology moving, or do you, because they're, it's very slow to re-educate yeah. them, so what do you see the direction? Yeah, it comes down to how you brand your technology. So for example, um, when we were working up the costing models for the fall detection system, and it was a fall detection system, each unit was going to be somewhere between four to five hundred dollars a piece because that took into account all the stuff we had to do with regu regulatory bodies, you know, medical device clearance, you know, everything else. As soon as we call it a home security product, it's a hundred dollars a unit. So we don't need any clearance from anywhere. We you know while you're gone from the house, it's detecting motion in your home and it's calling for help because it's seen that, but when you're home, lo and behold, it's also detecting if you fall. So a lot of it comes down to how you, how you brand these things. Now, there's a huge ethics issue here, right? For example, I don't know what, I think it's the same thing in the US now too, but you can go buy a scooter now at any hardware store, okay? Is that the same down here now? You don't need a, you don't need a therapist anymore to get you a scooter anymore in Canada. I can go to a local hardware store, I can buy myself a scooter anyways. Because, since that's happened, I think it's the same thing. Since that's happened, the number of deaths and injuries from scooters has skyrocketed because you don't now get the same training you would if you went through a therapist and went through the proper channels. Same thing with all these technologies, right? So, you know, how do we get around that? You, and for us to get to that model, these technologies now need to be near perfect, essentially, for them to be going through that model because you no longer have that person, you know, prescribing the device and, and, and really getting it through their heads that, look, you know, there are issues with this technology. It could do this. Do not become dependent on it. Still do your regular work. Or still, you know, do your, your typical fall prevention exercise, whatever else. If someone's just going out into a store and buying this, will they get that? Right? So there's kind of two sides of the whole argument at this point. Yeah. So I guess my follow-up is if, if we move it into consumer electronics, is there going to be an issue then to use that data to do some of the things that you, you were talking about with, you know, doing the preventative care and doing preemptive diagnoses once it's a consumer electronic product? Uh, I don't... No, I don't think so, because right now I can go into any drugstore and buy myself a, an automated yeah. blood pressure. And I know, like, you know, my doctor wanted me to keep a log of my blood pressure, and, mm -hmm. and you know, I did that with my automated device, and I had an app on my phone that connected the information, so I can send it to my email. So, doing the exact same thing, and that's a consumer product. Right? So, that, that's kind of the goal. So, it, you know, we need to move that same kind of model. So, the question is how to get the doctor's clinician on board. You know, whenever I present this work, especially the stuff around the fall detection or the prompting systems or the physiological monitor in front of doctors, first question I always get asked is how do we build for this, right? Because right now there's no incentive for doctors to be using this kind of technology to look after their patients because, you know, unless they, they have to have a personal vested interest and really want to do it, they're not going to be able to build for it, right? And again, this is a big argument in Canada right now is, you know, they're asking doctors to set up email addresses and have email conference with their patients, but 
they're not billable contact terms. Uh, the activities that you're monitoring currently, like hand washing or toothbrushing, brushing, might involve uh, the usage of maybe one or two cameras, right? Mm -hmm. But if I have to do the same thing for all possible activities an inhabitant wants yeah. to do in the home, yeah. do you think it's really feasible to wrap the entire house with cameras? Yeah, that's a good question. And that's why the coach hasn't become anywhere close to a commercial product yet. Um, so what we're trying to develop now is how do we develop a generalizable platform from two aspects. One from the sensing point of view. So how do we come up with a general set of sensors and vision models that allow us to easily do that? Second is from the planning decision making side. So uh, in DC we saw Jesse talk about SNAP, which is this syndentic analysis or planning or whatever. And essentially Jesse, Jesse Hoey, who's a professor at Waterloo, um, was one of my former postdocs, worked on coach with me, and what he's come up with is a way that anyone can go in and very quickly specify a POMDP model just by doing a task analysis of the activity. So we can kind of, and Jesse has this great term, smart Y, uh, DIY smart home, do it yourself smart home. So essentially he's trying to come up with that toolkit that can do that. Um, so that's kind of two approaches we're looking at to do that. The other thing we're also playing around with now is um, essentially taking all the screens and stuff off the wall and putting them onto a mobile robot base. So we put together a very simple robot uses a Roomba. So we built this robot for under 400 bucks. It's basically a telepresence robot. And now instead of the you know the washroom having a screen, the kitchen having a screen, the bedroom having a screen, the robot drives to where the person needs help and provides the same type of prompting. So all we've done is taken the whole Palm DP model and everything else, and we put it onto the robot. But we've left the environmental sensors as is. So now the robot now is working in combination with the smart home environment to do better localization, better tracking of the person, better localization of itself, obviously, and then to provide that additional input to the Palm DP model. So you have the working robot now? Yep. Okay. yep. As I said, it basically looks like a Roomba with a body on it and a screen. It's right. nothing, nothing fancy, so. Yep. So what are the robot's rules to be not a fall risk? Because it's kind of low to the ground. If I put a stool out in the middle of the kitchen, my boyfriend jumps over it. Yeah, no, the robot's this high. Oh, okay. I said we built a body on top of the Roomba, and then we put the screen up at eye level. Okay. So what that also does for us, though, is now we have cameras into the robot, so now we can see the person's face, everything else, right? Um, so yeah. 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 We have a couple of groups looking at uh, the idea of acceptability and adoption, and we're sort of wondering what uh, what sorts of things, as you've worked with on your subjects, that you see are really deal breakers yeah. for them in terms of. Uh, Rejecting it. Yeah, so we actually did a study. We put a paper out uh, last year in an assistive technology journal around the acceptability of this type of technology. And um, overall, it was actually a very positive response. Now, let me preface that by saying the way we, we did our survey was different than the past. In the past, a lot of people did work in this area saying, Would you accept these technologies in your home? And you got a lot of negative responses. Our question was if you had the choice of staying in your home or being removed from your home, would you accept this technology? We got overwhelming positive response. Now, our question was very loaded, but that is the situation that a lot of older adults face, especially when they start to develop cognitive impairment. It really comes down to the decision of, I can't get care in my home or support my home, I need to go to assisted living, long-term care, whatever it may be. So when we, when, we, <coughs> when we put it within that context of you know, what the reality of the question may be, you start to find that people are very accepting what, what they'll use to help maintain their independence. I felt bad asking that question. <laughs> All right, well, uh, let's thank our speaker. And he will be in room 130 uh, for the next couple hours. Sorry. <laughs> um, so if you would like to continue the discussion with him, uh, please stop by there. And thank you for coming. Thank you.